Our Bible reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, from the beginning of the chapter through to verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry. But since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfil his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a commission, not as a command. I wish that all men were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried, as I am. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say this, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Nevertheless, each one should retain the place in life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each one should remain in a situation which he was in when God called him. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freed man. Similarly, he who was a free man when he was called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brothers, each man as responsible to God should remain in the situation God called him to. This is God's word. Um, I've had two interesting passages today. The morning was a real challenge. This is also a bit of a challenge. Um, And uh, it's really the first part of a two-part series on marriage and singleness. Uh, And so you really do need to come next week. Uh, This week, obviously, Paul focuses, well, we will be focusing on the first part Uh, which deals with marriage, and the second week he deals a little bit more extensively with singleness and uh, whether or not you should or shouldn't get married. So there's a bit of everything for everyone uh, in this passage. 
There is a huge amount in here, so again, just bear with me. Um, it's not that I'm trying to extend the time by preaching a long sermon, but I do want to try and get through the material as faithfully as I am able to do so, and that might take a little bit longer this evening uh, because of the nature of the passage. Um, so let's pray and ask for help. Our Father, we come before you this evening, and we are so grateful that it was you who said, it is not good for man to be alone. And you created for him a perfect partner. And in creating for him a perfect partner, you created a perfect marriage, the only perfect marriage that has ever existed. And we thank you, Lord, that you enabled Adam and Eve to enjoy each other and to enjoy you before it all went wrong and they rebelled against you. And we thank you that you enable us to enjoy marriage still today. We know it is a very creation ordinance. And we thank you for the wonderful benefit of being able to enjoy marriage. And yet not all are married. Some remain single. And so we pray that as we seek to understand what you have to say about both of these very important subjects, that you would give us insight, that you would lead us, and that you would help us to come away not just better informed, but in some way having experienced the living God through your word. For Jesus' sake, amen. A young courting couple approached the gates of paradise and knocked on the door. As usual, St. Peter appeared and beckoned them in. As the young man approached St. Peter, he said, before we came, uh, come in, can we ask, can you get married in paradise? Peter replied, I don't know, fan. Take a seat and I'll find out. A young couple took a seat, and five months later, Peter returned. Yes, you can get married in paradise. Come on in. The young man approached Peter again and said, I don't want to tax your time and patience, but if it doesn't work out, can we get divorced? Peter drew himself to his full height and replied, If it has taken me five months to find a vicar in paradise, how on earth am I going to find a lawyer? Now, we can laugh at that, but you know, the statistics tell us in Australia that divorce is becoming very prevalent. And while there's a bit of humor in the fact that you might not find lawyers in heaven, the reality is lawyers are doing great business when it comes to marriage and divorce. I was reading recently in the newspaper, 2021, because some of you are sitting and saying, I've been married for 30, 40 years, I'm fine. Listen to this. It says on the 3rd, 14th of February, Valentine's Day, in the newspaper this year, I thought we were in it for the long haul. It's lonely and the disappointment never leaves you. How can you trust again? It does not matter that they face a shorter window of life. The pain of divorce after the age of 60 is deeply hurtful for many. That was a recurring message in dozens of emails I received last week from women and men who, just like Wally and Jackie Lewis, face separation or divorce after decades of seemingly happy unity. Her story is my story. One woman said of Jackie, whose 36-year marriage to the former rugby league legend made headlines. Others told of the shock at suddenly finding themselves single on the pension after assuming they would be together forever. I was married to my children's father for 32 years. But during the last two years, he had been having a relationship with a work colleague. Sandra wrote, names have been changed. This is a man who treated people well, me well, his children well, and was considered a pillar of the community. It has taken me at least 10 years to establish another life and to feel okay about being alone. It will never be good 
just okay. Leslie was married for 31 years. She supported her husband as he flew around the globe for his job. She had a career and raised their four children. And then on New Year's Eve, her husband broke the news. He decided that he was bored and had had enough, she wrote. My story is not the only one, I call it. The other pandemic. You would assume that the longer the marriage, the less hasty a split. But the steady rise in divorce among marriages that have spanned more than 30 years signifies a potential looming crisis. The divorce rate amongst married lasting more than three decades has increased from 6.3% in 1999 to 10% in 2019. That's tripled. And it seems to be no longer the Shirley Valentine effect for all, of older women walking out on their husbands. 1.9 males per thousand, age 65 and over, were granted a divorce in 2018 compared with 0.9 women of the same age, according to the ABS data. And if you were then to take some data on marriage and divorce in Australia, it's around about 40%. So this whole area of marriage is a very, very important subject. And the one thing that is a little bit sad, when polls are taken by Gallup, for example, in America, and I don't think the situation is necessarily massively different in Australia, the divorce rate between Christians and non-Christians, which you would think would, there would be a significant difference, is statistically insignificant. So in other words, divorce in the church is as bad as divorce outside the church. And so it's so important that as Christians we ensure that we are building strong, healthy marriages. Marriages that are based upon God's Word. Not marriages that are based upon secular psychology that may be popularized. When I sit down with a couple and I do premarital counseling, there are a number of things I say to them. One of the first things I say to them is divorce should never, ever enter into your vocabulary, ever. I don't care how bad it gets. I don't care how much arguing you're having. I don't care what's happened in your marriage. You should never entertain divorce. It should never be a word. It should be banned. The second thing I say to couples when I do premarital counseling, one of the things I say to them, is when you get married, you are making a commitment for life. That's it. You get one shot at this. You don't get another shot. If you get divorced, biblically, my understanding of Scripture, and Paul deals with them, 1 Corinthians seven thirty nine. the only thing that ends a marriage is death. Not divorce, death. That immediately rules out remarriage for both partners. And so this is a very, very, very important subject biblically. And Paul raises it in Corinthians because there's a problem in Corinth. You see that coming out in verse 1. So firstly, I want to look at marriage responsibilities. Look at verse 1. It's translated in an unfortunate way because it should have been in inverted commas. Now for matters you wrote about. Now this next phrase should be in inverted commas. It is good for, man, for a man not to marry. Now immediately, of course, you would ask the question, hang on, what does Genesis 2.24 say? God says it is not good for man to be alone. And now, Paul, you saying it's good for someone not to get married. Why this contradiction? Well, it should be in inverted commas. Because what Paul is doing is he's picking up a slogan that was being bandied around in Corinth. And the slogan that was being bandied around in Corinth is it's better not to marry. And so Paul says, well, I'm writing to you about that. You guys have taken on the slogan that it's better not to marry, and I want to tell you it's wrong. Well, it's wrong and it's right. 
it's, it's wrong in the sense if there's been a divorce, but it's, it's, it's um, right in the sense that if you've committed yourself to be celibate before God, then yes, it's better not to marry, but that's a different subject. But otherwise, the slogan that's being bandied around, the Apostle Paul wants to deal with that decisively. In fact, literally what that phrase says, when it says it's better not to get married, it actually talks about it's better not to have sexual relationships. Do you see the note in your NIV? If you look at that footnote in the NIV, that's probably a better way of translating it. The ESV translates it, I think, in a, in a more helpful way. It's talking about sexual intercourse. It, when it says you ought not to touch a woman, it is a euphemism for speaking about entering into a sexual relationship. Some of the women in Corinth believed that they had been ready raised from the dead. Now, here is the problem. They've come to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith, and as a result of their faith and their transformation spiritually, they believe they've been given that new spiritual body for heaven. So they believe they've entered into this kind of heavenly realm of existence in the earthly realm. Now that has implications, doesn't it? Because what does Jesus say in Matthew twenty-two thirty? Well, this is what he says. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage they will be like the angels in heaven, right? So this is the reasoning. The women in Corinthians are saying, well, we've entered into this heavenly state, even though we remain on earth because we've been created in a new creation by the Spirit, and they're making this separation between the physical body and the spiritual life that they've been given in Christ. Now that we've entered into this heavenly mode of existence, we don't need to fulfill our marriage responsibilities anymore. After all, there's no marriage in heaven. And so we're going to live now in a married state, because that's the people he's referring to in verse 1, as though we are not married. We're going to live in the state as though we already are like the angels. We have been already made like them. And the angels don't marry. So even though we might be in a marriage right now, we're going to abstain from any sexual relationship within that marriage because there's no sex in heaven. Do you see the problem? So Paul addresses this. It is, in theological terms, an over-realized eschatology. In other words, they have gone to the extreme in terms of their understanding of the end times. And Paul wants to correct that and say, no, because you've been made alive spiritually, it doesn't mean that somehow now you've entered into a different mode of existence in this world and somehow the body doesn't count anymore because you've been given spiritual life and you've been raised from the dead literally, uh, spiritually, where once you were dead, now you are alive in Christ. That, that, that doesn't change your mode of existence. You still have a body in this world and this body still functions in this world like it is all always functioned. Nothing's changed in that sense. And so he deals with this problem. So what was happening in a marriage now is as a result of this, we no longer are going to enjoy sexual relationship, the men in the marriage were turning to prostitutes. If they weren't going to get any kind of sexual fulfillment in their marriage from their wives, where do you get it? Well, you go to the prostitutes. That's where you express it. And, and it doesn't really matter then, does it? Because if you've entered into this, this kind of new heavenly realm of existence, well, sex is neither here nor there. And so Paul makes the point that they must not abstain from sexual intercourse within marriage. Let me read it for you to show you I'm not making this up. But since there is so much immorality, now the immorality relates to those in the sexless marriage going outside of the marriage to prostitutes to get sexual fulfillment. Each man should have his own wife. That's badly translated. 
it is in effect saying each man already has his wife. This is talking about a married couple and a woman, her own husband. So that's talking about a couple who are already married. married. They already have a husband and wife. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise, the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. So Paul begins by saying that you have a mutual responsibility towards each other to engage in a sexual relationship, in sexual intercourse. You don't have the right to say to your husband or wife, I'm sorry, I am now in a higher spiritual level plane, and that excludes us engaging in sexual intercourse. You just don't have that right. And the Apostle Paul then wants to strengthen that point by reminding these Corinthians who are already married to each other that your body does not belong to you. Why? Why does he say that? Well, because in the consummation of marriage, if you go back to Adam and Eve, you have two sides to marriage. You have covenant entering into an agreement with each other. And you have consummation, the sexual intercourse that seals the marriage. When that happens, what happens? Two become one. And so there is a merging of two people into a oneness in that marriage. It solidifies that oneness in Christ. Now the Apostle Paul says, now that you are one, now that you have become one in the in the uh, sexual act of intercourse, you do not have the right to control your own body. You don't have the right or have ownership any longer over your body. You have a mutual responsibility towards each other in the way in which your body is used. And so when you enter into marriage, you have to realize it's not just about me. It's not just about my sexual satisfaction in the marriage. It's not just about what I get in the marriage. It's about what I give in the marriage to the other person. And so there is this mutual responsibility towards each other regarding sexual intercourse within the confines of marriage. Then he tells you when sex should be withheld. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now follow the logic. The Apostle Paul is saying, The only reason you should volitionally make a decision not to enjoy sex within the marriage is if you have mutually agreed to spend some time in prayer concerning an important matter, and instead of enjoying that sexual intercourse within marriage, you're going to take that time and you're going to spend on your knees together praying. Now, don't misunderstand what Paul's saying. There are other reasons why you may not engage in sex in a, in a marriage, in terms of there may be physical reasons. The person might be unwell. They may be sick. Uh, there may be some infection. There, there are other kinds of reasons. And what Paul is talking about is not that situation where there are circumstances like that that prevent you from enjoying sex, but this is rather where there is a denial of sex within the marriage from one person to the other, with there being no good reason for that denial. Paul says, if you are going to not have sex in that situation where you are both healthy and you are both capable of enjoying sex in the relationship, it should be for prayer. Prayer alone. Then he adds something too. He says, if you're going to do that, make sure that it's only for a limited period of time. In other words, 
what the Apostle Paul is recognizing here is the strength of our human sexuality. And he is saying to them, what might happen is if you extend this period of time out too long, one of you may get tempted and you may become consumed with your sexual passions. In modern day terms, you may turn to pornography. Because these passions, which God has created in us, become so overwhelmingly strong, and now you've been deprived of enjoying and expressing those passions within marriage, that they overwhelm you to the point where Satan takes advantage of your weakness, and he drives you to commit some kind of immoral act. Now, for the Corinthians, that was engaging in prostitution. In other words, don't allow Satan to gain a foothold in your life in this area of your sexuality because he's dying to drive you into doing things that are immoral and to, for you to use the reason or the excuse, well, my wife or husband is denying me sex and marriage. What else could I do? Paul says, don't give him a reason to attack you at this point. So make sure it's only for a short period of time. The concession is related to both agreeing. Both of you agree. And both of you do it because there is some important matter that you are praying about. Maybe you're praying about whether or not to have children. Maybe you're praying about a big financial decision you have to make. Maybe you're praying about a job that you are considering taking up. Maybe you're praying about moving from one city to another city. But there's an important issue that you are both grappling with. And you decide, and instead of enjoying that sexual relationship, you will take that time where you would have had sexual intercourse and you will pray. So can I say to you, if you are married here this evening, and there are many of you sitting in front of me who are married, can I encourage you to take this word from God and to apply to your marriage? If you are frustrated because you are living in a sexless marriage and there is no physical impediment to you enjoying a sexual relationship with your husband or wife, repent and sort it out. Because God, through Paul, by the power of his Spirit, says there's only one reason for you to deny that. If you are not married this evening, but you are hoping one day to be married or in a relationship with someone and planning on getting married to that person or hoping that you will get married to that person in the future, until you are married, you need to abstain from entering into a sexual relationship with them. But once you are married you are able to then enjoy that sexual relationship and in the same way, make sure that you do it according to God's word. Don't take sex and use it as a means of manipulation of the other person. Now, let me say to you, when I have sat down with marriages that break, it's generally one of three reasons. One is financial, two is communication, and three is sex. Secondly, if those are marriage responsibilities, there are some marriage guidelines that he lays out in verses 8 to 16. Now, what I want you to see as we move through the rest of these verses and also, as we look ahead to next week, there is one constant theme that reappears again 
and again and again. You saw it there, didn't you? Stay as you are. Stay as you are. Stay as you are. In other words, the Apostle Paul is trying to communicate by that, not that it's wrong for you if you are single to want to get married. That now that he's saying stay as you are, you must stay as you are for the rest of your existence. But rather, as we will see as we get to the end of this, is that he's wanting you to understand that your status in Christ is not contingent upon whether or not you are single or married, divorced, separated, in a marriage where there's a non-Christian, your status in Christ is the same. And you can find contentment in whatever position you find yourself in this life. But we'll get there. Firstly, the guide to singleness Verses 8 and 9. Now, I want you to understand what's going on here. Again, the NIV doesn't translate this as well as it could. Because what it does is it gives us the impression in verses 8 and 9 that he's talking about unmarried single people. But that's not the word that is used here. The word that he used now to the unmarried, that un word for unmarried, is a word that is better translated now to the widowers. There was no Greek word for widowers. No Greek uh, to refer to widowers. It also fits into the larger context of the book dealing with husbands and wives. The masculine article is used prior to that. And Greek, if the masculine is used, then it's referring to the masculine part of the next word that comes. And then fourthly, in verse 11, Paul forbids divorced people to get remarried. So he's speaking now to widowers, those who once were married. And he wants them to understand some things. He says to them, verse 8, now to the widowers and to the widows. Now you can see why it now makes sense to translate that as widowers rather than uh, unmarried. I say it is good for them to stay widowed as I am, or unmarried as I am. Poor, that state is not married. There's some point at which there are many who think he was married. We don't know. There's no certainty over that. But at this point, he's unmarried. It is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. In other words, if you're dealing with people who have been married and enjoyed sexual intercourse within that married marriage, and now, uh, for whatever reason, their partner has died and they are no longer married, they have been widowed through death of a partner, through death of a husband or wife, and now they are still burning with sexual passion and they find it difficult to control that sexual passion, Paul says, get remarried. Now, those are the only circumstances in my understanding of Scripture, there are many who disagree, where it allows for remarriage because the married partner is dead. And so they've been released from that marriage. Look at 1 Corinthians uh, 30, uh, 7, 39. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. Now what is true of the man is true of the woman. So under those circumstances where death is, Paul is saying to those widowers and widows, if you burn with sexual passion, rather than express that in an immoral way, get married. Are you with me? Okay, let's keep moving. Secondly, the guide to Christian marriages, verses 10 and 11. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, 
and a husband must not divorce his wife. Now, in that one verse, or those, uh, verse 11, he's speaking about divorce. When he says separate, it's the same word, or it's a similar word that speaks about divorce, because separation in that society was the equivalent of divorce. Now, in the Greco-Roman society, we need to understand that divorce was very different to the way it is conducted today. You could, as a, a person, walk out of your marriage, and then it, it came to an end. If you were a Jewish man, you could say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and you were divorced. That's all, three times, and you were divorced. Now, in the Corinthian society, in the Gentile society, it was possible for women to divorce their husbands. It was much more rife. In the Jewish community within Corinth, it was far, far more difficult. In fact, it was very rare that a woman was able to get out of a marriage and divorce her husband. And that's just the way the Jewish law and culture worked. Now, what Paul is saying is that uh, because a person chooses to walk out of a marriage and get divorced, that doesn't give you the right now to get remarried. He says that, and a husband must not divorce his wife. So while Paul is against divorce, he recognizes that there are going to be marriages inevitably where divorce occurs. And there are a variety of reasons why divorce occurs. Let me just, if I can add this and just say this, because I want to be clear about this. No person, whether it's a man or a woman, should ever feel as though they must stay in a marriage with that person living under the same roof where there is abuse going on. Please understand me correctly. That means that person should get out of that home and go into an environment where she is no longer subject to that abuse. That doesn't necessarily mean she or he can divorce. It just means they need to be out of that abusive situation. So please understand me correctly here. Now, what does he say? For the rest, I say this, I, not the Lord. So he wants to emphasize that uh, he is now uh, giving his opinion. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer, and when he says, sorry, he's not giving his opinion, when he says, I, not the Lord, what Paul is saying is I'm giving this command. It doesn't come from the Lord because the Lord hasn't said anything concerning this subject. So in other words, Paul's not saying what I'm saying is any less binding than what Jesus has said. He's simply saying, Jesus hasn't said anything on this. That's why I'm saying it. I'm covering something that the Lord Jesus Christ himself has not covered uh, in, his, his, uh, in what has been recorded of his writing. So now what does he say? To the rest, I say this, not I, uh, I not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. So now you've got a situation that I've had to encounter many times in the pastoral ministry where a couple have got married and seemingly when they first got married, both were believers. But as the marriage has progressed, it has become clear that one of the people in the marriage is no longer a believer or no longer claims to be a believer. And so their true colors come out to the surface. And now that they're un, 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 they are out in the open about not being a believer, Paul is saying, that doesn't now give you the right as a believer to say, right, they've declared, they've nailed their colors to the mast, they've said they're an unbeliever, I'm going to divorce them. Because I got married believing they were believers. Or, alternatively, there's been a marriage where one has been converted and the other one hasn't been converted. So now you have this unequal situation where one is following the Lord and the other is not following the Lord. 
Paul says, as a result of that change situation, you can't divorce. There's no reason for you to walk out. And so, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer, and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce. Now, of course, that phrase, if he or she is willing. Now, Paul is using the example of a man, but the same example can be used of a woman. If he or she is willing to continue in that marriage, don't divorce. Now, there are situations, and I've encountered this in the pastorate, where, where that happens, the unbeliever says, I'm not living anymore with this believer. I'm not interested in this marriage anymore. I'm going to get divorced. Well, Paul's going to say something about that, but um, that's not his point right now. And if a woman... Um, okay, so I just want to deal with that part. So the, the Apostle Paul is saying, continue on in your marriage. Now he goes on to deal with a slightly more difficult problem. Verse 13. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband, this is very misunderstood, has been sanctified through his wife. And the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. Now, what on earth is he saying there? Is the Apostle Paul saying salvation can be inherited? So the children of the believing wife now suddenly inherit the salvation she has or the father has, and they become saved by virtue of her salvation. Oh, well, we know that's not true, because if the Apostle Paul was saying that, he would be contradicting himself elsewhere, and he would be going against what he has said in other parts of Scripture, in Ephesians and Colossians, there are many places where he's spoken about salvation. But what he is trying to say is that some of these women and men were saying, well, now that I'm holy, now that I'm a believer... If I engage in a marriage or a sexual relationship with an unbeliever in the marriage, aren't they going to contaminate me? Aren't they going to make me unholy? Is this alliance now an unholy alliance, meaning that, you know, I should get out? And, and isn't this going to affect our children? And Paul says exactly the reverse. Paul says, no, 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 no. What he means when he says you will sanctify is he means that when you begin to live out your Christian values in that marriage, when you begin to show that you are a new creation in Christ, when you begin to live according to a different standard, God's standard, by very fact of how you are living, the attitudes you have, the words you use, you are going to have a positive influence on your husband or wife who is unsaved. Moreover, when your children see your godly example, and when they see the way you worship and love the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a roll on effect into their lives, and they too will be influenced by your holy, godly witness. In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying to the Christian in the marriage, hang in there, stay in the marriage. Do you not realize, Christian person, that you, by virtue of your Christianity and your relationship with Jesus Christ, are positively affecting the person who is now an unbeliever and your children? In other words, he has a very high view of God's grace. God works through means. You came to faith not because one day you woke up in your bed and you decided today I'm going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You came to faith because you were exposed to a Christian or you were raised in a Christian home. And as a result of the input of people into your lives or attending a church and hearing the gospel preached, you came to Christ. Not so. In the same way, in a marriage, 
because of the constant witness of the Christian in the marriage, because of their testimony, there is a greater likelihood that the people in the marriage will come to faith. Let me give you a really good example of this. When I started at the very first church I pastored in South Africa, it feels like such a long time ago, there was a couple in the church who were married and the wife had become a Christian. And she was married to a Muslim man. And she had endeavored, because she came to a Christian quite early in the marriage, she had endeavored to raise her children in a Christian home as much as she could. He would occasionally, you know, Christmas, Easter, come to, come to church. He, I went and visited them as a couple. And we got into some discussions about Christianity and about the Lord Jesus Christ and some of the difficulties he had, but there was no movement. Her daughter came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as a result of her witness. When we went back for the first time to South Africa, we had been in Australia almost three years. We went back to the church just to greet folk, and they had, in fact, asked me to preach, I'd hardly walk through the doors. And this man, who was a professing Muslim, bounded up towards me, and he grabbed me, and he said, Ian, you're not going to believe this, but I'm a Christian now. I'm born again. And in that intervening three years, through the efforts of the pastor who followed me, he had come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And through the years of faithful, godly witness of his wife. That's what Paul's speaking about in terms of them being sanctified and made holy. John MacArthur uh, if I can just read this as well, just to reinforce this, because I think it's so important. It tells the story of a young woman who came to him after a service one Sunday morning and told him that when she was growing up, her grandmother was the only Christian in the family. The grandmother used to speak to her of the love of Christ and witness to the family in what she said and by what she did. Eventually, three of the four grandchildren came to know the Lord, and each one declared that their grandmother had been the greatest influence on their decision for Christ. So can I say to you, application need. If you are in that kind of a marriage, if there's no one in that kind of a marriage, then that's fine. But if you are in that kind of a marriage, don't give up on your husband or wife. If they are unsaved, keep persevering in your godliness. Keep persevering in your faith. Keep showing them that you are a new person in Christ. And keep praying. Who knows that God, through your faithful witness, might in due course draw them into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes on. Here we get to some contra controversy. <laughs> but if, verse 15, but if, an unbelie if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. He has the problem. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. What does he mean? They are not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Now, what does he mean by that phrase, they are not bound? Is Paul contradicting himself? Is Paul saying in verse 15, you are released, you are not bound in your marriage, you're released from your marriage. Now that you're released from your marriage, 
you can remarry. And then in verse 39 of the same chapter, he says, but you can only remarry when the person's died. Well, the first thing we need to see here is he's not addressing remarriage, is he? He's not talking about remarriage. He's talking about those who are in a marriage where the person has walked out of that marriage. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is you are no longer bound to fulfill your marital responsibilities towards that person who has walked out on you. You are no longer under obligation to provide bed and board. You are no longer under obligation to continue to act towards them as though you were still married. They cannot ex expect to still continue on as though nothing has happened, even though they've walked out of the marriage. Now, there are some who would walk out of the marriage but still wanted to live under the same roof. And the Apostle Paul is saying, if you are in that situation, you're not bound anymore. You've been freed. And so what the Apostle Paul is trying to emphasize here is not the issue of remarriage. He's not addressing that. He's addressing the issue of unbelievers walking out of the marriage, or even a believer walking out of the marriage and saying, I'm done and dusted. Paul says, right, if that's what they've done, you're not under obligation towards them to fulfill your marital duties and responsibilities. You're released from that. And you're silent at that point on remarriage. You see, the issue here is not remarriage. That's not what the Corinthians are struggling with here. They're not asking Paul, can we get remarried? No, no, no. They were trying to get out of their marriage responsibilities. And Paul is simply saying that only occurs when the person decides to leave. Then and only then are you free from those marital responsibilities. You're not free from them if they stay, but only if they walk out. It's simply that they are not under bondage to maintain the marriage at all costs. Now, let me make this practical. I'm sometimes asked by believers, what do I do when my husband or wife has walked out and wants to get a divorce? I don't want to get a divorce. I don't want to be the one who initiates it, but they want a divorce. What am I to do? Well, this is Paul's answer, isn't it? This is Paul saying, you're not bound to keep that marriage going. If they sue for a divorce, that's on them. Let them sue for a divorce. That's their responsibility. That's their accountability towards God. You're not bound to have to try and force to keep that marriage going when they don't want to keep it going. And when they've walked out and they've said it's over. You're not under obligation. Do you see? That's what Paul's concern here is about the believer's response to the unbeliever who wants to divorce them. If I can quote a commentator. Remarriage is not an issue at all. Indeed, it seems quite the opposite. In an ascetic context in which people are arguing for the right to dissolve marriage, Paul would scarcely be addressing the issue of remarriage, and certainly not in such circuitous, roundabout fashion. No, he doesn't contradict himself later in 1 Corinthians 7, 39, where he says you are bound for as long as you live. So can I say to you, because I know some of you have experienced this, if you are in a marriage where the other person has walked out, and even if they may be a believer, not even an unbeliever, and they have determined that they no longer want to be married to you and they want a divorce, and you haven't been the one who's initiated that, you don't have a responsibility at every cost to try and keep that marriage going. Let them do it. You're not under obligation. You're not bound. And then finally, I said I was going to be a bit longer. I'm really sorry. But it's the only way I can get through this material. 
and unless you want me to do the second half next week, and then it's going to go on to three weeks. Marriage contentment, verses 17 to 24. You'll be much quicker here, so you can relax. Verses 17 to 24. Nevertheless, now listen, each one should retain the place in life the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is the rule I lay down for all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not become circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. Now you read that and you think, what is going on here? You're talking about marriage and now you've introduced circumcision. What are you doing, Paul? He knows what he's doing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each one should remain in the situation which he was in when God called him. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you gain your freedom, do so. For he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freedman. In other words, you might be a slave in human lives, but you've been freed by God. In his sight, you're free. Similarly, he who was free, a free man when he was called, is Christ's slave. In other words, you who were free and not a slave have now become a slave to Christ. You've just changed ownership. Um, brothers, each man, uh, you were bought, uh, sorry, then he goes, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brothers, each man as responsible to God should remain in the situation God calls him. Now, he uses those as illustrative examples in respect to reinforcing his point about marriage. Stage yard. They walk out, stage yard. If you marry an unbeliever, stage yard. If the unbeliever is not interested and, and leaves, stage you are. If you're single and you're not, you, you've been widowed, stage you are. But, and so now he uses some examples. And, and the point that he's simply making is, you know, if you're a slave, you should be content in Christ. If you're free, you should be content in Christ. If you're married in a bad marriage, you should be content in Christ. If you're unmarried, you should be content in Christ. Christ is everything. And he, he reminds them, you were bought at a price. What is the price at which you were bought? It is the life of the Lord Jesus Christ who poured out his life for sinners, who gave himself holy so that they may be rescued. You have status in Christ. You are bound up in Him. And what matters is not what the world thinks of you, not how the world classifies you, not how the world thinks of you. All that matters is that of what Christ thinks of you. And you're one of His now. You belong to Him. You've been elevated in becoming a child of Almighty God. That is enough. You see, contentment is never, as a believer, bound up in our circumstances. It's not bound up in what job we have. It's not bound up in what status in life we have. It's not bound up in whether or not we're married. It's not bound up in our academic achievements or lack thereof. It's not bound up in the way we look. It's not bound up in our fashion sense. It's bound up in who we are in Christ. And Paul says, do you realize, Christian, the highest price possible was paid for your salvation? There is no higher price that can be paid than for Christ to shed his blood that you might be delivered from your sin, that you might find salvation in Christ, that you might be reconciled to God, that you might become a slave of Jesus. Do you see, believer, the value that has been placed upon you? It is an estimable value. There is no greater value because it's bound up in Jesus. And because of that, says Paul, 
our contentment is in him and him alone. Yes, you may be in a horrible marriage, but that's not where you're going to find contentment. Some of you who have yet to be married may end up in a bad marriage. That's not where your contentment lies. Sometimes we think that it's the externalities that are going to bring us contentment, a nice house, a nice things that we own. Paul says, all oh, that means nothing. Only Christ matters. Jesus and only Jesus is what brings true, lasting, eternal contentment. And so he says to the slave, you're still a slave? It doesn't matter. You stay as a slave. And if people think you're rubbish because you're a slave, who cares? You belong to Jesus. What a higher status could you have than that? And for all of you sitting here who have a relationship with Jesus, you were bought with the precious blood of Christ. What more could you ask for? What more could you want? And be given such an exalted position in Christ. If you are not a believer here this evening, can I say to you, Jesus reaches out to you and says, come. Forget what the world thinks about you. Forget about what status you've been assigned to in this world. Forget about your position. If you want true status, you come to Jesus. You come to Christ. And you will find true contentment in Him. And not the world. Amen. Our Father, what an incredible word you have for us. We thank you for Jesus. Oh, he's so glorious. We have such an incredible Savior who gave himself for us. So I want to pray for any here who don't know him. Oh, Lord, work in their hearts. Draw them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Show them his beauty, his majesty, his preciousness. And for those who do know Jesus, Remind them of how precious they are in your sight because of your son. And help them to find contentment, whatever their situation in life, married or unmarried, divorced or widowed, single, whatever it is. May they find great joy in Jesus for his sake. Amen. Won't you stand as we sing our final?